Well, brother, it's my desire once again to speak on speak to you about things that build your confidence and assurance that you are Christ's. As children of as God's children, it's important to know that we're saved. It's important to know that, not guess this. And there's no room for doubt and unbelief when it comes to one's salvation. And today there does seem to be a terrible tendency to assume that one is saved. But this is not right. And it's not wise to do so. Men can assume that the wicked one can't touch them, when really they're vulnerable to his attacks. One can assume that they know the truth when really they've embraced another gospel. That's possible. Well, men can assume that they're in right staying with God, and at the same time they're doing things that bring down his wrath upon them. It's just like ignorance. They are not aware of these things. My point is, you're putting yourself at great risk when you're not sure of your own salvation or going off a guess or a hunch. You're not, it's not safe ground to tread on. So this shows the importance of working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Our main passage helps us to do away with assumption and doubt and to make effort to know if we are, in fact, the Lord's people. Now, it starts off here in verse 10 saying, Give diligence. That's how he begins. Some of these other versions, they word this very well. Now, John Wycliffe, this was a really early translation, it says, Be ye more busy. It's like, occupy the majority of your time with this. Put a lot of time into this thing. Another one says, try hard to show. Another one says, be eagerly diligent. Another one says, work hard to prove. Another one says, make sure. Make every effort. Be very sure. Be zealous. And then this other one says, it says do all that you can. It's like, no limits. Whatever it takes. Do whatever is necessary to confirm these things. Yeah. Now, the word diligence... And this is an old Webster's Dictionary. It says that this word means steady application in business of any kind, constant effort to accomplish what is undertaken, exertion of body or mind without unnecessary delay or sloth, due attention, industry, assiduity. And in the Greek it says that it's to hasten, to make haste, to exert oneself, endeavor, give diligence. So, I mean, as you can see, this isn't some, leaving us with the impression that this is something to be casual about or sloth or slack, take your precious time. Rather, it's throwing your full force into this, so to speak. You're giving everything you got. Taking the best that you have. Now, there's some version they say try. Like one of them would say, like, try to prove. Well, that's a little weak, you could see. We're not just, like, making an attempt to do this. Like, just give it a try. Try to see if you're safe. No, no. Not try to do it. Do it. That's the point right there. Do these things. You want to leave to people with the impression that this can be done after all. That they're, not that their efforts will be of no avail, but not just doing it, but it's doing it with a great amount of zeal and effort. And this is, this is something lacking in the professed church of our time. Babylon has, spiritual Babylon, I should say, has produced lazy workers. It's like that servant with buried his one talent in the ground. Oh, this will be, this will be enough. This will be enough. It's not enough. And men, it just leaves men with little knowledge of their spiritual status. Men aren't very aggressive when it comes to what, how God regards them. Are they one of the people? They don't give a lot of effort to know these things. Men are too content to think they're saved rather than knowing that they're saved. Well, that's not enough. Our main passage, however, does not t just tell us to make these things sure, but to give all diligence to do so. Just prior to our main passage, same chapter here, Peter writes this, starting at verse 5. He says, Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness Charity. But what does he say before that? Giving all diligence. You're throwing yourself into doing all of these things. Adding. So the main point here is that this is something that the saints are zealous to be sure of. I mean, don't you desire to know that God's called you? Don't you want to know that? Amen. Is it really enough to assume that one is saved? Well, God forbid that this be, be preached from a pulpit. No one who professes to believe should ever be in a state where they question their calling and election. Which brings us to the next point. Like, what's the thing being made sure? Make your calling and your election sure. I'll take a few minutes to expound on these two things before going any further for the sake of having a proper understanding. Some versions they say your, the calling and choice summons an election. And the New Life Version, even though that's a pretty weak one, it does say this well. It says, make every effort to know that you've been called out and chosen. <laughs> now, called out, I'll hook on that one right there because that's... That, that's an important thing to see here. The calling mentioned in this passage no, in no doubt refers to those who are saved as opposed to, opposed to those who have been invited. A calling can be an invitation. Like the general call, God commands all men everywhere to repent. Whosoever will may come, that's like an invitation that's sent out. 
uh, the invitation for men to turn from their wicked ways and live and have life. However, calling is also used to confirm why you're saved. It's because you've been called out of darkness. In Revelation 14, 17, those who are with Christ, they're called and chosen and faithful. Amen. So when we read, make your calling sure, the passage is not speaking about confirming that you've just been invited, but confirming that you really are saved and you have been drawn out from this untoward generation. That's what you're confirming. Confirming that you're out, that you have made that move, so to speak. The calling is what confirms that God has chosen us. The Lord will draw all those whom he's chosen to himself. As he has said, no man comes to me except the Father first draws him. The Lord has drawn us by the message of his gospel. As stated in 2 Thessalonians 2.14, this is the means by which the call has been made. And by responding to that call, you're showing yourself or confirming that you're one of the elect because you've responded to that call. It's a unique call that only his people can recognize. As Jesus said, my sheep, they hear my voice and they follow me. They respond to his voice. They do something. They make a move. And another place says they won't follow the voice of another. Now, the election mentioned here, that no doubt refers to God's choice. And too often, unfortunately, men, they argue about this being true. Who, like, does God choose or does men choose? But our main passage cannot be referring to our choice, for this would be nonsense. It does not make sense to make your own choice sure. As if the passage say, make sure this is what you really want. I've heard people kind of make that kind of attempt, but it, they, don't, they don't look too smart when they try it. But surely no man would be foolish enough to assume that we've called ourselves out of the world, right? That's mentioned the same passage. Did I call myself out? Well, how can we conclude the same with the other? That is evidently God's calling. So if that's God's calling, then it's God's choice in this text too. And even the scriptures, they refer to the saints as the elect. That should make it pretty clear who did the choosing. I'm chosen. It is said that God he chose us to salvation before the foundation of the world. That's in 2 Thessalonians 2.13. And before the world was even created, God knew who his people were. He knew what he was going to do with his people, and he saved them at the time of his choosing. So the passage here is exhorting us to make certain or sure that you're one of those people that God has chosen for himself. I mean, people read about this, so it's like, yeah. well, confirm. See if you're one of those people. Make some, make some effort here to do this. Now, to better grasp, like, when we talk about, like, make it sure, like, perhaps I thought something that would help with this is, like, maybe observing why we're called and why we're chosen. Perhaps this will help a little bit as to how we should reason on this. Now, concerning why we are called, the Lord said he's called us to be his own people. Or as the scriptures say, you're called to be saints. That's what, that's what the Lord's revealed. It's in Romans 1, 7, 1 Corinthians 1, 2. The scriptures also tell us that God has called us according to his purpose. In that same chapter, it says he justifies and he glorifies those whom he has called. Mm -hmm. We've been called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. We've been called to peace, called unto liberty, called in one body called unto his kingdom and glory, called unto holiness, called out of darkness and into his marvelous light, called unto his eternal glory, called to glory and virtue. And get this, even in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15, it says that those who are called are to receive the promise of eternal inheritance. That's what's said about the called concerning election. You see, the Lord, he chooses men for a reason. This is not just for nothing. Let's look to the disciples. Jesus said, he, he spoke about calling them. He chose them for a purpose. What did he say about them? This is in John 15, 16. Jesus chose his disciples, and he said that he did so so that they, they should go and bring forth fruit and that their fruit should remain. Yeah. Same chapter, yeah. verse 19. Jesus said that he had chosen them out of the world, and that the, the world would hate him for it. Now, out of the world, that's, that's an expression you definitely want to catch a hold of because that means you've been separated called you out. I've taken you out. I put you over here. Now they're all saying, hey, he's not one of us. He's not from our camp. He's a stranger. Get him out of here. That's, see, it's hostility. There's an evident change there, an evident change of status. The world knows it. Jesus said that, he said to Ananias that the apostle Paul, he's a chosen vessel unto me. That's what he said. That's a chosen, that's, that's like something that's set apart for my work solely. You've been set apart for the work of God. So this is not just for nothing. Now, concerning the saints in general, it's said that God has chosen us in Christ that, this is Ephesians 1 verse 4, should we would be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, that's not the cause. That's the result of the choosing. Like, because God chose you, this is what is going to happen. And again, Paul told the Thessalonians that God chose them to salvation. That's the reason. That's why he did to, to save them. Then Peter, he says the saints are a chosen generation. 
First Peter 2, 9, but then maybe what, 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 what can we say more about? Can you tell us more about that, Apostle Peter? He says that this chosen generation is a holy nation, holy nation, a peculiar people. And he says that this chosen generation was to bring forth the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Amen. So, you know, just observing these various things, we can see that called and elect are spoken of as being as holy, set apart, in the light, special, saved, having fellowship with Christ, justified and glorified, among other things. But providing this information should help us see how we should make these things sure. Mm -hmm. So next, the question is, well, how do you make it sure? You'll find a lot of people quote this passage. And I'm talking like, you know, just outside, you'll hear people quote it, but rarely anyone really gives much comment on it. Like, how do you do that? It's, it's kind of like just assume people automatically know. What's well, a good thing to kind of just go over? Well, how is this done? These are not things to be assumed and left up to speculation. Now, to me, you know, just considering calling, if we were to start there, the key to making your calling sure is to observe what you've been called to. If the scriptures say we've been called into light, then the question is, well, am I in the light? That's something you've got to observe. Am I illuminated? Can I see where I'm going, or am I just groping in the dark and running into walls? Now, the scriptures say we've been called unto holiness, then the question is, well, am I holy? <laughs> well, what does God say holiness is? You see, that's something you can look into. Right. Something to confirm. Like, well, if, well, if I'm meeting that description, then, hey, that, that means I've... I've responded to that call. I'm one of those called people. Well, if, this, if it says you've been called out of the world, then the question is, well, am I of the world and received by it? The world loves its own. Mm -hmm. It does. <laughs> Something to think about. Like, well, how does the world treat you? Yeah. Take, take, take a minute and think about that. This is the way to think on that matter. Take every moment to remember why the Lord has called you to himself. Mm -hmm. Now, one may speculate whether or not he's been called, but until he understands why he's called, he's just wasting his time. By observing the reason for your calling and what we've been called into, we see whether or not God has called us. Mm -hmm. Now concerning election, I'll take a few different approaches here, but we are to observe the char characteristics and descriptions of God's elect. As I said concerning the called. Now in Revelation, that same verse I quoted earlier, chapter 17, verse 14, I believe, says that, that those are with Christ, they're called, chosen, and faithful. Okay, faithful, that's the word you want to highlight or hook up with there, because that's the description of the elect. They're faithful. Like the sheep that Jesus said, he said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. They never perish. And no one can take them out of my hand. They don't follow the voice of another. That's what he said about his sheep. That's what's said about the elect of God. Right. Amen. They are faithful to the very end, which is after all why they're saved, because they remained with the one who bought them, because he kept them, of course. It was by his power that this was so. So according to the scriptures, you know, you just take the highest view you can, the elect will never leave Christ. They are faithful to him to the very end. Now, how does that line up with the sloppy things said about saints today in Babylon? They say, well, they sin all the time, they fall away. Well, this, this is not what the Bible says about the elect. Mm -hmm. It's not what it says. They're faithful servants. They do what the master says. They're wherever he is, and they will be until the end. Well, on top of being faithful, Jesus spoke of the elect not being able to be deceived. Matthew 24, 24, it's being a false Christ shall rise up, deceive many, if it were possible, the very elect. <laughs> Poss if it were possible, it means it's not going to happen. Showing that they're not deceived due to the keeping power of God. Like if it wasn't for God protecting hand on them, they'd just be swept away with the rest. But that's not going to happen, is it? The passage shows that the elect will never be utterly lost, but will ultimately persevere. Yet people live unholy lives, and they cling to immoral things, take delight in vile things, and then they say they're the elect. Now, in my judgment, if a person's not living holy before the Lord, don't be talking about election. Don't. Because that's how the elect are described. You're making a contradiction. Well, it's almost like, wait a minute. This says they never, they never perish. This one says they, follow, they don't follow the voice of another. What do you mean you're saying you're one of the elect? Well, see, you've got to line up with what you're saying here. That's how they're described. They're faithful to God. They're not deceived. <coughs> Ever. <laughs> Always faithful. So seeing that this is said about the elect, how do you confirm your election? Well, I'd say first, the faithfulness of the Lord is proof that you've been chosen by God. As long as you are by Christ's side and following him, you are showing yourself to be genuine and real. Because that is, after all, what the elect do. They stay with Jesus. Now, when the devil casts fiery darts, you quench it with that shield of faith. Prove it. Show you're one of the elect. Put out that fiery dart. When unwanted thoughts enter your mind, attempt you cast down those imaginations and bring every thought into captivity. When a stranger calls out for you to follow him, don't follow that stranger. Flee that stranger. Run away. When you get weighed down in the race, cast off every weight and the sin that so easily besets and get your eyes on that prize and run. If you sin, confess that sin so God will forgive you of that sin and have his son cleanse you from all unrighteousness. 
Search the scriptures daily to see if what you are hearing is true. And test the spirits to see if whether they be of God. See, these are like ways you confirm yourself to be one of God's elect. This, this is what, in the end, this is what they would have done to reach the end. To be more specific, Paul said this. This is in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 13. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so do ye. Well, that's one of the ways you confirm election. Put on. Put on something. I mean, the fact that he says put on as the elect of God should make it evident that the elect are the only ones that can really do it. The scriptures say to put on the new man, too. That's in two sections of scripture. Ephesians 4.24 and Colossians 3.10. If you have been born of God, well, then you have something to put on. Put, show it. Put it on. Amen. Confirm it to yourself as well as those that were around you as well. That is something that confirms you're, in fact, a new creature in Christ. These are, resp- these are like commands that only like a new creation can respond to. I mean, other than that, you're just pretending. Or just mm-hmm. trying to put on, you're just going to have to resort to some other means to deceive. But the Lord knows who we're his. The scriptures also speak of the faith of God's elect. Well, that really stood out to me in going over this. Now, if the elect are faithful to the end, they can't be deceived, and that should tell you something about the faith that they have. That's something to really look into there. This would mean that they don't have little faith. This would mean that they never departed, shipwrecked, or erred from the faith. It would have to mean that their faith was great and that they remained steadfast in it. They contended for the faith. They fought the good fight of faith to the end. Now, if these are things are true, then you have to ask yourself, do I have that faith? Yeah, yeah. Right. Examine yourself, see if you have uh-huh. this faith. Amen. With Amen. diligence and zeal, you can know these things are true concerning yourself. Amen. Now, there is a reason why Peter told us to do these things, and the reason is found in these verses 5 through 10 here. Because, you know, he mentioned, he talked about adding to your faith. Yeah, right. Add to your faith. That's something to hook on to there. Now, Peter, he, at the beginning of these, uh, at the bottom of verse 4 there, he speaks about you've escaped from the corruption of this world. You escaped. And then that's when he mentions adding to your faith. He mentions things like virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brother kindness, and charity. Making known that if you have these things in you, you will not be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of Christ Jesus. You won't be. But, then he goes on to say, verse 9, But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. And hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. See, that's not an unconverted person. (laughs) The saints have been purged. But that possibility is there. Forget you've been purged from your old sins. So obviously there are some risks here to consider. You're in a dangerous realm. You've got enemies around you. (laughs) Hazards. That's that's where you get to this. Make your calling election sure. When you get that, that's when that comes in. So our very passage provides a way of making that calling election sure. Add to your faith. Look at that. Add. Connect these things together. Yeah. And as by doing so, you grow in these qualities, which you, you look at all these things. These are characteristics of the elect of God. Yeah, right. The elect of God are patient. They are, they're temperate. They have knowledge. They're, they're kind to one another. They're godly. They have charity. They have virtue. And they're long-suffering. So in our main passage, we provide a way to make your election sure. So as you can see, these, this calls for a lot of self-examination. Yeah. We see whether or not we be in the faith. This goes along with like proving your own selves. Yeah, right. Amen. We must we must show that we are genuine by doing these things. We not only make our call and election sure to ourselves, but to others as well. Now I'll share a few things here about like just how certain saints were spoken to. This is encouraging to go over. Paul told the Thessalonians God chose them and called them. He told them that. Amen. Second Thessalonians two thirteen fourteen. Now that should tell you about the state of the Thessalonians. Take note of who that was said to. Paul said at the beginning of his letter to the Thessalonians that they grew in their faith exceedingly and that their charity toward one another abounded. That's who he told them. That's who he said that to. In 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 view of these things being true, Paul could say, you've been chosen. You've been called. Because these are characteristics of God's chosen people. Paul told the saints at Ephesus that God chose them in Christ. And he described the Ephesians as the faithful in Christ Jesus. See, that's who he said that were chosen in Christ. He told the Philippian brethren that he was confident that the one who begun a good work in them would perform it till the day of Christ. Philippians 1.6. Mm-hmm. Paul thanked God for every remembrance of these brethren, calling them dearly beloved and the saints in Christ Jesus. See, I say this to encourage you. Don't be afraid to speak this way toward those who are being faithful to God. Yeah, 
Don't be afraid to speak this way. Men are are scared to say the word alike. Don't be scared to say that. Don't be afraid. And live in such a way where people can speak this way concerning him. Well, see, these descriptions are here for a reason. He describes what the elect are like. He describes what the called, what they do. And so you can live that way where men can say, well, hey, God has chosen you to salvation. You know, that can be said to you too, and you can say it to others if they are living right. Well, that's the thing. He says, make these things sure. Some of the other versions, they do put this interesting way. It says, the youngs, he said, make it steadfast. John Wycliffe, he said, make it certain. Well, why not? He says, show it, confirm it, prove, secure. I've spoken about ways to make this sure. Right now, I want to deal with is that point, like, who are we making this sure to? That's something to think about. Are we making it sure to God? Well, surely this ain't so true. <laughs> God's the one who made the choice in the calling. Amen. God already knows who his people are and have known before the foundation of the world. So it would be absurd to think that we're confirming our calling election to the one who has done the calling and the choosing. Or perhaps we make it sure to other people. Well, to extent, to extent that can be true. And some of the versions do seem to have present the idea that we're not just professing to be God's elect, but we're proving and confirming that we are by the way that we live. Hence the words like prove it, show it. That's how some of them said it that way. That's the, that's the impression I've gotten. And even John Wycliffe, he, the way he translated, he said, by our good works, we make our calling election certain. That's how he worded that. So it's true. We do have to match what we profess to be true. And if you claim that you're God's elect in your life, we'll match that profession, if you are, in fact, the elect. Those who see you will see this to be the case. Uh-huh. Now, even though I do believe that's true, I don't believe that is primary what he's saying. I do believe that the passage primarily means that we confirm these things to ourselves. Amen. 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 It is an exhortation not to merely assume you are elect, but to confirm it with holy living and godliness. Often the election, when election is mentioned, men are not confident whether they elect or not. I mean, it's kind of a hazy issue, and this is due to just terrible teaching on the subject. You can't fault everyone for being unsure because they just haven't been taught correctly. But... Our passage shows that we can know our election by the way that we live. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, like, like the passage says, in some versions, they say, put yourself to the test. Well, if you are one of these people, then, hey, you have some ways to show it. There's certain things that the elect can do that you can't do if you're, you know, not one of God's right. people. So, yeah, take initiative. Mm-hmm. Examine yourself. See what you can do. Mm-hmm. See, what, see what you're capable of. Now, here at the end here, it says, if you do these things, you never fall. So as we live holy before God, you add your faith, you marry Christ, you confirm your calling election, but then the pastor says, you do these things, you never fall. Never fall. Now other versions, they have some interesting renderings of this, but I believe all of them are true, even though some probably would not be able to receive them. One says, you will never stumble. Another one says, you'll never fall away. You will never trip and fall. You will never come to ruin. This is a good one. You will never abandon your faith. How about this one? You will never be lost. And John Wycliffe really hit it away most people will receive. It says, you shall not sin at any time. <laughs> That's how he said it. Now, the thing, well, I mean, if you're you know, looking at what the passage is saying, what he said was true. <laughs> yeah, right. Now, the thing about this passage does not leave us with the impression that our security is automatic at one point in time. Mm-hmm. Men may assume they will never be lost after that initial entrance, yeah, yeah. if they first come in, or after that first profession of faith. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. That's it. <laughs> Locked, cast in stone. Or even after one single act of obedience. Well, I did this one thing, so therefore, therefore I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. I'm good to the end. It's all, it's all smooth sailing the rest of the way out. But that's not what our main passage is saying. This is similar to what the scriptures say. Well, walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Same, same kind of reasoning used here. That's why, that's why it was used there. It's like, well, if you do these things, you're not going to sin. <laughs> You are not going to fall away. You're not going to wander astray if you do these things. While making your calling election sure, you're making yourself steadfast and unmovable because the one who's determined to confirm he belongs to God will do whatever it takes to remain standing because, after all, that is the description of God's people. They remain standing. They win the fight. They endure to the end. They will not, overly, they will not utterly be overcome by the wicked one. So in view of that, to confirm, I mean, the logical conclusion is to confirm you're one of the lost one of the saved is to endure to the end and do whatever it takes. Those who are elect will persevere to the end when Jesus comes. In the meantime, we confirm our election by doing whatever it takes to remain Christ until that time comes. 
That's the thing to see. We do this throughout our, the remainder of our lives. We do not just want to endure for a while as those who have their roots barely in the ground, like those in stony soil, just a little in, that's it, right out of the ground when the tribulation comes. We want to remain standing. We want to endure to the end. What I have learned from this is the fact that God chooses who will be saved does not make our own efforts unnecessary to make that salvation sure to us. It is made sure to us by our own exertions to obtain evidence that we are in fact the children of God. If we are in fact true children of God, there will be evidence. And you can see it. You can't see it. It's there. It's not hidden from you. This is why we must examine ourselves to see whether we be in the faith and prove our own selves. Seek to know these things, brethren. As you look for evidence of these things and strive to be in right standing with the Lord, you will not only be kept from falling, but you will have confidence and assurance that the Lord is in fact on your side. That will encourage you to press on. Yeah,